Why the hell would you want to leave big salaries, lacquer suits, <laughs> and operate in the land of the poor, aka entrepreneurship? Let's start with you, Michael. I mean, we, we know you as the, the former CEO of FNB, um, well, an, an entrepreneurial one, but your tipping point. Um, Taleb said the uh, three things that are most addictive in life is heroin, carbs, and the monthly salary. Monthly salary determines the way you think, the way you behave, the culture you adopt. So I wanted to get rid myself of that monthly salary, and I'm privileged to be able to do it. I mean, I, I think you know, some people have the salary not just because they like the lifestyle, they yeah. you know, have to have it. And then after that, I did two interesting things. I walked the Camino in Spain. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's yes, this yes, thousand-year-old yes. pilgrimage. And you just walk it and you think. People do it when they, I don't know, get divorced or it's a death in the family or they change careers. When they get divorced. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. And then you can talk to them if you want to or you can just think. So I thought a lot and, you know, what you want to do. So you've got to get that mindset of being in a corporate out of you. Yeah. It really is very, very different to the startup vibe. So I did that. And then the second thing was I went to Singularity University. You may have heard of it, but they specialize on exponential technologies, everything from 3D printing to artificial intelligence and health. Yeah. You know, I mean, they're guys there that fundamentally believe we could live forever. You know? I mean, it's like visions that you know, really contradict everything you believe. Anyway, so I was just extremely inspired by what the future can do. Mm. Um, so I hope I've gotten rid of all the banking cobwebs, so I'm sure you're going to grill me about that. And we'll talk about, we'll talk about security and F&B at some stage. <laughs> <laughs> but, but ultimately, <laughs> what inspires me, and I think that's why there's an audience here, is startups are about creating the future. It yeah. is the most effective mechanism to create the future. Yeah. Governments try. I think the best they can do is provide a sound platform, and you know, some are better and some are worse. Big businesses also try, and actually they've got a whole lot of advantages, but disadvantages, we can talk about that later, but the real thing that creates innovation that takes the world forward is the humble little startup, and that's what inspires me. Yeah, it's about the big businesses opening up to those startups with, yep. with, with informal opportunities as well. Some of these big businesses need to catch a wake up, but we'll, we will get there. And just, I mean, Marcus, wonderful, you're going to be talking to us about Bitcoins. I mean, you're probably the only oak in the room who knows what you're talking about at the moment, right? So, <laughs> no, there's a couple, uh, yeah. And yeah. Five, five or six yeah. other people put yeah. their hands up there. But I just want to run through, I mean, we, we know Michael is a loving father, former banking CEO, o overachiever, 36, you became FNB CEO, uh, wine lover, you head, you head up investment company, company uh, Monte Grosso, we'll talk about that. But Marcus, um, CEO of Bitex, which is a universal Bitcoin platform, which you'll unpack for us. But you're a former investment banker, 3i, Morgan Stanley. Do you normally, I mean, after 2008, do you tell people about that? Uh, not so much anymore. <laughs> Just checking. Yeah. But let's talk about your tipping point. You know, what, what made you leave the suit and do what you're doing at the moment? So, so what I think a lot of people don't know is that Michael was partly responsible for this. I don't know if I've, I've told anyone in public about this, but um, I, before I went into finance, I actually, when I was young, I used to code a lot and so on. So, so the other engineers on my team hated when I say this because I just, oh, I used to code, you know, and they know I can't build anything. Um, but it's something, you know, I've always wanted to work in technology businesses. And yeah. I went through a, career, a finance career in London and, and in Singapore and so on. Yeah. And um, I remember I was in, visiting a friend in Parkhurst in Johannesburg and we were having dinner and I was talking about inventing the future. All the stuff that Michael's talking about, how can we change the future? How can we use technology to make things better? And he said, you should really meet this Michael Jordan guy. You, guy, you know, you sound like him. He's like saying all these things all the time on Twitter. And, and so, you know, we had a mutual friend and uh, I, I got a meeting set up with Michael when he was still CEO of FNB. And I was about to go on a journey uh, similar to the journey that he did uh, with his walk yeah. Yeah, around the train. I took a train around the northern hemisphere through Russia, China, northern America. Um, and we had a quick conversation. And, and, and part of that, you know, I was already looking at doing a transition out of banking into my passion, which was technology. And, and we had some really, you know, good, I wouldn't say everything that happened in that conversation, but there was a lot of, you know, push towards you should do this if you really believe in it. Um, you know, I'm also from banking and I can see the future and so on. Um, and, and through that process, I eventually then quit my banking job, um, and I ended up living in Palo Alto for a while before we started this Bitcoin company. Oh, awesome. You said you, in banking you can see the future. No, I think people in banking would <laughs> oh, like sorry, to... Sorry, I picked that up and I was going, <laughs> yeah. what? Yeah. No, no sorry, we can see the future. Bank we can see how the future is on. not going to be like banking. <laughs> yeah. Just checking. Okay, yeah. no. But, so the shackles have been removed. As I can see, uh, you guys obviously phoned each other this morning and said, what color shoes are you wearing? Yeah. yeah. 
What's the banking entrepreneur yeah. look like? He wants to be looks look good, like, guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> looks good, eh? Yeah. I prefer a banker that looks like this, but they're not bankers right now. So for you, it's a huge learning curve. It's, I mean, you, you, you come out of a very structured environment, which is banking. Michael, we'll talk about your entrepreneurship. You did some stuff yeah. within FMB, which got it to uh, you know, be the most innovative bank in the world. But just talk to me a little bit about the journey that you're currently experiencing, having put those shackles behind you and taking some of the, the, the core IP that you've, that, that you've gone throughout your experience in banking. But let's talk about the learning curve. Let's start with you, Marcus. Yeah, I think, I mean, all the stereotypes that people hold about, you know, if you work in a really structured environment in a bank and mm. then all of a sudden you're in a very different environment, I must say I was surprised that most of this stuff is true, right? Like you read a lot about it and um, I think it was a big, you know, a challenge not just for myself but for many other people in our team. We, we're recruiting senior people from even companies like Amazon and Google and even though yeah. these are big technology companies, people still have that kind of big company mindset. Um, I think we've, you know, all been very fortunate in, in, in certainly in my journey, and I think the rest of our team, to have people that have been through it before. I was just speaking to Alan uh, backstage, and he yeah. mentioned, you know, someone, a, a guy from Fire ID called Milan, and I think a lot of people here in the audience know him, and he, you know, he's built many startups, and he's, you know, he's been through this a, a, a number of times. So these are the guys we were lucky to learn from, you know, to say, look, you know, change the way you're thinking, don't worry so much about the risk, try something mm. new, and so on. So I think having some kind of informal mentorship, I don't want to say formal mentorship because I think there's a lot of people that are mentors that aren't helpful for people trying to break the mold. Um, having those kind of mentors and, you know, I think it just takes a little bit of a shift in attitude. I think a lot of, uh, you know, uh, especially in our culture and in South African culture and many other emerging markets, there is a lot of risk aversion. Um, and that's one of the amazing things about Silicon Valley. When, when I stayed there, you know, when you fail, it's almost, you almost get like a badge of honor to say you failed, well done. Um, will find you on your next try. Yeah. And in many other markets, it's not like that, right? If you fail, that's your one shot. Um, even if it wasn't your fault, you're a bad businessman. Mm. Um, and I think that's going to take a very long time to, ch to change in, in many markets, including South Africa. But I think if you, if you spend time in other markets where it's valued, it's easier to do it in, a, in an environment where it doesn't appear to be valued. Um, so that's also been helpful. Awesome. Great. It's so good getting insights from people who we, we read about and go, oh, if only I could speak to them. Now you get the opportunity. Now, Michael, let's talk about your learning curve. I, I know you love your family. I know you wanted to spend more time on your farm. And I also know you wanted to start seeing your family more often as well, which is probably well, yeah. one of the reasons you've decided to make this move. But let's talk about that learning curve. And you know, you know stuff. I do. So. <laughs> kind of um, a little bit. The, the, look, there are tough things in corporates too, but for me the tough things were audit committees, compliance committees, risk committees, transformation committees, board committees, executive committees, strategic com committees, sitting, you know, projections, PowerPoint, and all those type of things. But actually, it's also a lot of fun because you have a huge amount of resources and leverage. So if there's a difficult employee, you can get advice from HR or some obscure law case, there's a legal division. And if your technology doesn't work, you just pick up the phone and so on. So, you know, first thing, first kind of tipping point or for me in starting a new business is none of that exists. You know, I had to you know, get a printer. So yeah. you walk down the street and you go to a shop and there I was walking Stonebush with my printer. Then I had to set it up, which was quite tough, and get Wi-Fi. And eventually, <laughs> I got it working, and there's no paper. So I walked to the checkers, and there I'm buying my checkers. And anyway, so it takes like a couple of weeks. I mean, a lot of people have gone through. It's very, very basic things that you completely yes. take for granted, undercover parking and so on. So that's one part of it. <laughs> the, 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 Especially in Stellenbosch. No? There's yeah, not yeah. a lot of that happening. Yeah, no, so you have none of that. So, okay, so that's on a very kind of functional level. I, I think on a deeper level, I, I'm trying my hand at venture capital now. I'm I have to say I'm humble and small. I've got a team from Angel Hub here that helped me with it. My approach is I'm here to learn. In Silicon Valley, and you can kind of point a lot of fingers at them, that they figured a lot of stuff out. Everything, for, uh, you say MVP earlier and yeah. Lean Startup and Sell Early and Fail and all those type of things. Yeah. They've been at this much, much longer than we have, 30, 40 years. So you can learn from these guys. Yeah. And that one of their sayings there is it takes $60 million to make a venture capitalist in the sense that you've probably got to lose $60 million yeah. before you really, really understand. So you can have all the knowledge in the world and all the MBAs and all those type of things, and, um, and, and that's kind of the process that I'm in right now. And so the tipping point hasn't completely happened. It's learning <laughs> by doing. And anyway, it's, it's 
very easy to say what bets you should have taken in hindsight. It's mm. quite difficult when you sit there and you have the capability to invest. You love the ideas. You kind of fall in love with the type of thing. Yeah. But, you know, for that thing to work out. And it's, also, it's also a very different space when you're in banking and someone comes and they want money from you. It's easy just to say, no, <laughs> convince me. Yeah. Um, and then you've got all these spreadsheets and all sorts of stuff that you have to work with. Now you have someone who has a brilliant bloody idea, yeah. great team, a really crap data room, and you don't know, okay, am I going to invest? How much am I going to invest? And, and it, it's about sort of dealing with all those sort it's, of things as well. It's an adversarial process. Yeah. Um, in the sense that you kind of, they want something from you, you want something from them, you want, you know, massive yeah. upside and no downside and so on. Yeah. And then you start liking the individual and sometimes you miss each other on valuation. In that sense, it's a lot easier to just invest in the stock market. You know, I, I th in mm. fact, I think the existence of a very well-functioning, efficient, liquid stock market, which yeah. the JSE is, one of the best regulated in the world, and it's so easy to just invest there and when you don't like it anymore to take funds out. So venture capital is very long term, you don't know what the exit is going to be, and something is highly illiquid, and you're making decisions over very long term, and it's this adversarial process. Yeah. So, so I still have a lot to learn about it, but I, I hope that in saying that, yeah. I'm giving some perspective what it's like from the other side, mm. you know, people that are funders. It's, it's, it's a tough process to go through. And it's at its infancy, comparatively speaking, to yes. the rest of the world, um, it, it is, so it's, it's, it's exciting at the same time. I want to go move on. We'll talk about yourself and F&B and intraneurship a, a bit later because there's a, there's a lack of story there. But Marcus, <sighs> Bitcoin, right? For me, one of the biggest barrier to entry, or at least an adoption barrier to entry, is the fact that people don't have a cooking clue what it is. And when they hear about it, they think, uh, okay, it's not tangible, can't touch it, uh, can't print it, damn it. Um, I'm not going to yeah. adopt it, <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, is, am, I, am I right in, in, in saying yeah. that? One of the biggest issues well, with it? You, you, all those things that you just said now is the same with other money as well, right? Yeah. You can't, you know, if you have an F&B bank account, you can't touch that stuff. You can't print, I mean, a government can print it. Yeah. But I think people, I think there's a misconception that you, mm. if you see the numbers on the screen, you think there's a bank vault somewhere with some yeah. money in it, and it doesn't work like that. Um, I think what Bitcoin has certainly done is it's raised awareness about how does money work? Yeah. Uh, what is money? How do governments control money? Um, and, and, and I said to someone the other day, and you know, if you, even, if, even if the whole Bitcoin experiment fails, mm. if the only outcome is that it, it made people think about how money works, how payment systems works, governments, and so on, that would be a good outcome for society, right? Now, of course, I hope that it's not going to fail and it will do much sure. bigger things. Um, I'm happy you haven't asked me yet what is Bitcoin or explain <laughs> no, how we'll it works. No because, um, but you're right, there's a lot of misconceptions and part of our job um, as an early mover in this market is to help educate people. And I think frankly, that's something that the entire industry has been pretty bad at doing. Yeah. Um, there are companies that are funded with $100 million in Silicon Valley. I speak to the founders and I say to them, when are you gonna start running big ad campaigns, you know, media campaigns, videos to help people explain why is this beneficial to me, how does it work? And they just said, no, they're not planning to do it. Okay, so tell me, what is Bitcoin? Why is it beneficial to me? <laughs> uh, to, to, to summarize, a, obviously, a very complicated subject easily. I think if you look at moving any form of digital ownership, if yeah. I wanted to move that a couple of years ago from one person to another person, so that could be a domain name, mm -hmm. money in a bank, um, any, anything that's online, I have to go through an intermediary. And the reason for this is because of something called double spend. Because it's virtual, I can copy paste it, I send yeah. it to Michael, I send it to you, yeah. you, you would be none the wiser, right? Yeah. So intermediary like FNB would make sure that if Michael moves 100 Rand, it only goes once to me, or it only goes once to you. Mm -hmm. And they charge a fee for it, and it might take some time. So if it's the same bank, FNB to FNB, that's quite easy. FNB to AppSub gets a bit more tricky, because they have to reconcile things. Different countries, yeah. different currencies, different languages, then it gets very complicated. Yeah. So you get this whole mesh of things. Now you have Visa plugging into it, MasterCard, SnapScan, everything. All, what Bitcoin really does is it allows people to send this value on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, directly from one person to another person. So if you think about it, like everything else is not on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. There's a lot of apps that say peer-to-peer -peer loans, peer-to-peer -peer finance. It's not peer-to-peer. -peer, it goes through some intermediary. Okay. Bitcoin is direct from one person to another person. And the easy way to th think about it is just that Bitcoin is one big ledger of debits and credits. And instead of you having, being on a FNB ledger or APSA ledger, this ledger sits across the entire internet, and when I send that value to you, mm. it replicates across all computers in the world at the same time, and everyone has that same record of ownership. And if you think about the implications of that for, for the online industry, anything to do with value ownership, uh, transfer, whether it's money or in, even other types of assets, yeah. 
That's a phenomenal technological achievement. And so that's the crux of what Bitcoin is, the technology. Now, how that translates into making it usable for people and so on, there's, you know, there's a whole narrative be, be, uh, around that. But I think that's hopefully a, a useful description. You know, and if yeah. I can come yeah. in there, I mean, I, I think that was a very good description. I think so. I think that deserves an applause. <laughs> <laughs> I actually understood that. <laughs> Um, I've, I've read what Marcus has written about it, and obviously it gets very complex very quickly, and yes. then at the end, simple again. There's the, also, I wanted to make the point, there's this currency which is volatile in its pricing, yeah. which has actually been a bad thing for Bitcoin. The fact that everybody just focuses on the currency and its valuation, and the whole blockchain behind it. Yeah. And what Marcus quickly said is we don't need banks anymore. You don't need these intermediaries. I mean, that's a revolutionary thought. That's the stuff people got their heads chopped Sounds off. Sounds like you don't on. agree, you don't totally agree with that. <laughs> no, I think it's possible. I, th I yeah. actually think it's possible. Okay. I think governments are going to fight against it. Regulatory mm -hmm. authorities, when they start fully understanding it, will, you know, I, I mean, there's a whole lot of things. For example, monetary policy. Um, mm. We don't know if quantitative easing right now is working or not. Okay, a lot of people say, look, we will not fix it. What we sometimes forget is where the world would have been had it not been for yes. this massive money printing. Yeah. It could have been the third Great Depression or mm. whatever. And let's say Bitcoin takes over the world. How are you going to do monetary policy? To say, anyway, there's a whole lot of unanswered questions. The thing I like about Bitcoin is something completely different, which is that the process that Marcus had just described can be free. Okay, so it's possible for one person to transfer value to somebody else at zero cost mm -hmm. or from one country to another country. So it really is the business model implications of this thing that I think is, are underexplored because free is the price of our era. Free mm. is the new normal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, everything will become free. I mean, we've just accepted for granted that Google searches are free or maps are free or Facebook is free yeah. or Twitter is free. But many more things that currently charge prices or fees mm. will in time become free. But and this will make banking free. Make banking free, right? But yeah. I mean, you're, 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 the people you used to work with at First Rand, for example, wouldn't sit by idly and allow markets to do what he needs to do because that's obviously going to impact heavily on their bottom line if everybody now decides to move over to that. You know, I, I'm going to make a controversial statement, which mm -hmm. is it's not just the institutions, it's also the, the customers. Yes. And it has to do with this funny thing that we economists call price elasticity or so on, is people switch easily in some cases, I don't know, from telco provider to another telco provider, maybe if they're on prepaid, but banking is like marriage, you know, people really yeah. just don't want to switch easily. Yep. So you'll have to have challenges who come up with something that is so compelling that people say, you know what, I'm willing to go through that KYC process or whatever it is because I can save X hundred rands a month. So the challenge for the big institutions, mm. the F&Bs and so on, is to transform themselves clever enough so that these new guys can't, can't win. Either way, the small guys are going to become a little bit more like the big guys, and the big guys are going to become a lot more like the smaller yeah. guys. That's yeah. the future. And that, I mean, the fintech space is hotting up. Peter but, de Villiers is back here from Silicon Valley yeah. doing his own thing as well, so it's getting really, really exciting. I just want to move on because I, you know, I have a look at the clock, and I mean, I'm not very good with numbers, but I can see how much time I've got left. I just want to talk about entrepreneurship for a sec. I mean, you, are, you had your suit. You're, you're probably the most loved CEO, I can say, because just based on people phoning again, Michael, you're done, when you're going to get him back on again? All right? Um, and it helped that you guys had the lowest um, cost structure as well, when compared to, although Capitec, I think, has probably kicked you behind by now. But um, you guys have been brilliant. But I think the one thing you're known for is, to, is, is getting F&B to the level of number one most innovative bank in the world. Take me through the process of sitting behind that desk and, and, and even just conceptualizing this and, and, and taking it through to its We conclusion. were at a Bosperat, as South African companies like to do. This yeah. one happened to be in, in Mozambique at a great spot. And I was a new CEO, incredibly uncertain of myself, but trying to pretend that I knew what I was doing and be confident. And we'd been through an exhaustive like, process with a new exco, me the new CEO, where our strategy should be. And all I wanted was a drink. I, you know, I thought, this is great. We got to a point, let's go and have a drink. And one guy, a bit of a rebel, actually said, that is so boring, what we've got there. It is profit and customer satisfaction, staff satisfaction, ROE, but it's like this could be any bank. Yeah. And then we kind of sat down again without the drink and said, like, what is the one thing that can make us different? And that's when innovation was born. Mm. So I'm very glad I didn't have that. Well, I had the drink, <laughs> but later then. And then it was a long process. Then I remember launching this thing in front of a you know, crowd of senior leaders at F&B. We were very disbelieving. I thought, oh, yeah, that's the latest management fad. But we started making euros of people. We did this thing where we, any employee could win a million bucks. Yeah. It's still the thing I would you know, 
advise anyone to do because... Is it still running? It is, and some other companies in South Africa have adopted it. You know, if you win a million bucks, your jokes are funnier immediately, and you are more attractive to the opposite sex, and people like true. that. That's a, yeah. one of those things. <laughs> and, um, and, and the net present value of all the innovations when I left was close to five billion rands, just for that year, just for the top 40, which mm. you know, I took a week off every year just to judge the top ones. So it is incredible what big companies can do, but they have to be able to take risks, make mistakes, and you know, some of the consequences of things go wrong. And most big companies are set up for that not to happen, which also makes sense. You know, so yeah. they've developed these antibodies, and new ideas are like germs that come in, yep. and they go like, that doesn't work here because it's different to, to how we are. And, and that's the big challenge. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap here. You, you wanted to add something. There. That was the thing going, Kina, shut up. You better wrap, wrap. But I'm sure they can wait a minute. Um, I want to talk to you specifically, Marcus, about <laughs> advice you have for people sitting out there wanting to do, take a similar leap. Maybe they're not in investment banking, but maybe they're in that cushy job that Michael was talking about, and they want to get the hell out and try something. It's not as simple as saying, I'm going to get out. Yeah. Um, it's a process. What advice do you have? I mean, I'm, I'm probably the worst person to ask for advice because it's the first time I've done it, and it's I'm not really in a advice. position to be saying, mm. I know exactly how it works. Um, and, you know, one thing that I have learned, just a personal thing, observation, and maybe it's applicable to some people mm. or not, when I, when I decided to potentially quit my job, I had the opportunity where the company would say, you know what, go on a sabbatical, you know, come back in six months, some of the things don't work out and so on. And I consciously said, you know what, I'm going to just break this thing off now and I'm going to quit and I'm, I'm never going back. And I think for a lot of people I've seen that work in big companies that are entrepreneurial, they want to try things. Yeah. They kind of half-heartedly try it in their free time a little bit. Maybe, you know, work. This stuff is all in, right? You have to just go all in you know, burn the boats, there's mm. no going back. And if you do it like that, you put a lot more pressure on yourself and a lot more stake in the game. And I think, I would suspect, you have a higher probability of succeeding doing it like that. Love it. Michael, from your side, I'm not going to ask the same question. I just want to talk, because you've obviously played both sides as a CEO as well. Your advice to big supply chains out there, because people say to me, oh, access, access, access to money is a problem. It's not the problem, it's access to market. And that's what I believe in. You might, might disagree with me on that point. But if you have access to market, people are willing to give you the money, right? But a lot of these big supply chains just aren't opening up. Yeah. They're not creating yeah. informal spaces. I'm not talking about the big, the big contracts. I'm talking about the little spaces um, and, and localized supply chains. I mean, that's one of the big things I've had to learn. Dealing with big corporates is incredibly tough. And the sales cycles are incredibly long. And you're dealing with people, it's again, this monthly salary, that they don't realize how crucial it is for this business to now land the deal. And one of the worst things is that long drawn out maybe. Mm. You know, just say no. Okay, that yeah. would be the easiest thing. The second thing I would say is, and it, it, it operates against this not invented year syndrome. If big corporates would only be so brave as to say these are the problems that, right, that we're facing right now. For a bank to say, we're struggling with KYC, or I don't know, when the guys don't pay our loans back, we're struggling to get hold of them, you know, and give, publish that, and let businesses come up with solutions to those problems, you know, build something that can help them work. So, so the big mistake companies make is to try and develop it inside, and they take longer, and it costs more, and they don't completely get it right, because they want to do it themselves. Yeah. Uh, again, and I, you know, I hate uh, going back to America, I think Americans are really, really good at that. They don't mind buying innovation, buying up whole teams and so on. Mm -hmm. And we still, maybe this even comes from the bad old days where you, know, you wanted to be self-sufficient, you wanted mm -hmm. to do it everything mm -hmm. yourself. The new world has changed that completely so that you can outsource some of these things to nimble little startups. So government as well could do that, but I wish corporates would say no quicker. I mean, I wish they would yes. say yes a lot more often, but say no quicker, don't string them along, and then secondly, publish what their needs mm -hmm. are so that small businesses don't just come up with what they think the problems are, but, you know, real needs that businesses have. I mean, it's a, uh, I won't, and thank heavens I don't have enough time to go into yeah, this. Yeah. But, um, you know, certain banks could learn from that if a, a company like Intersect came to them and said, listen, we'll make your OTP security a lot better. They, they, they wouldn't be exposed to a barrage of questions on a radio show, for example. No, no, they some, actually, of these, some of these hosts are quite tough. They, <laughs> they, they try. But uh, Marcus, <laughs> Michael, what a pleasure, what a privilege. Yeah. Thanks to both of you. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening.